Okay, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about I.O. And maybe not a little bit, I have counted there are more than 40, more than 40 mentions of I.O. in this talk. So bear with me. A few words about me. So I've been, I have started doing some real hardcore imperative programming. And uh, recently I have switched to functional because I simply like it. It uh, has some principles that uh, make it uh, more pleasant to code it. And so in 2012, I picked up Elixir and he has been using it since then. And right now I'm using it at my day job. I love it. And uh, today I'm going to share, you, to share some of my observations about uh, how different approaches uh, are applied to handling uh, IO code. And we'll see an example of how to do that in Elixir. Okay, so this talk is, uh, like, like I said, uh, just uh, uh, some kind of uh, observations, uh, reflections on uh, what, what things, uh, what approaches we have been using and which are good, which are bad. So the painful part about the evolution is, uh, I'm particularly referring uh, to the JavaScript here, because uh, like the, in the, it's just interesting to see like, uh, the, the approach to coding in JavaScript has been evolving. And so we started with callbacks, and then people have invented pro promises, and now they're uh, gradually migrating to something more pleasant to work with. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> well, first we'll look at some definitions. Yep. Uh, then we'll do a quick survey of the approaches, right? And then we'll look at the example of a, of a problem that involves uh, handling IO code. So first, what is an I.O. An I.O. operation? An I.O. operation is any kind of operation that takes, uh, it takes some amount of time and usually involves communication with external devices. Right? So usually we are trying to uh, place uh, that operation outside of the main uh, flow of the program in order to be able to execute other things while an I.O. operation is going. Okay, uh, so uh, as an example, well, the definition I'm using here is uh, rather broad because uh, there are lots of, uh, there are different kinds of uh, tasks that might take uh, a long time and that are asynchronous in nature, right? And so if we, if we manage to catch uh, uh, the characteristics, the common characteristics that those tasks share, uh, then we can use the same programming techniques to uh, to manage uh, different kinds of I.O. tasks and uh, other kinds of tasks. Right, and... Uh, oh, I think you know that. Yeah, so what's a concurrent I.O.? Uh, concurrent I.O. is basically a piece of code or an approach to handling multiple, uh, multiple tasks that involve uh, I.O. at the same time. Right, so this is essential uh, in programming or uh, in developing applications because we want uh, our applications to be responsive. And that means that uh, we need a way to have a task running and at the same time perform some other task, whether it be computations or another I.O. And what is a functional I.O.? Uh, and the way I define it, functional I.O. is something that, uh, like it's a way of programming that uh, involves these uh, basic principles. Uh, the first principle is uh, that uh, we are working with the values. It means uh, we don't just uh, call a function for its side effects. We get something back, uh, a value, and we can uh, use that value to call uh, other functions. And uh, then by means of functional composition, uh, we can build up an operation that involves uh, side effects. Right? And uh, of course, uh, since these are side effects, we we want to delay their effects uh, until a later point in time. So we want to first build the computation and then execute everything. And this uh, usually leads to a declarative approach to describing our computations. Right, so a quick survey of the approaches. What have we been doing so far? So the basic I.O. is just, uh, well, the basic I.O. It's, uh, we can directly use uh, the interface provided by uh, an operating system uh, which uh, is the actual thing that implements the communications between uh, different devices, right? And but this is not very pleasant. 
So in this example with the C code, we can see that uh, okay, typical example we define a buffer of certain size, then we call a function to read uh, some amount of data that fits into that bu buffer. Uh, then we see if we read anything, we process uh, a chunk of data, and then we do it, do that in the loop again and again until we read all the data. Right? So this is like the lowest level uh, approach. And uh, some of its benefits is that, well, it's simple to a certain extent, right? Uh, and uh, another benefit is that it gives you a very fine-grained control over what is going on at any point in time in your program execution. But at the same time, this fine-grained control is something that we usually want to avoid uh, when we're doing application development, where, where we are writing more higher, higher level code, right? So, uh, another, uh, well, like, uh, a, more, a more modern approach to doing I.O. is directly connected to the, well, to the types of applications that we tend to develop nowadays. So, for example, uh, graphical user interfaces or uh, web, uh, web servers, most of them involve some kind of run loop, which is simply the main loop of the application. So when you write an application, you are using a, a framework, and that framework usually provides a run loop. So this is just uh, the main loop that, uh, that is responsible for uh, communicating with the system, uh, handling system events, and basically serving as an intermediate layer between the application code and the OS. Right? And, okay, so run loops, they give us um, a way to perform asynchronous I.O. And in a rather structured manner. So for example, uh, in, the, in the app kit and uh, which is used in OS X and uh, in iOS, there is a class called NS URL Connection. And uh, this class uh, uh, is responsible for uh, performing HTTP requests, right? And when we're in creating an instance of that class, we can assign a delegate to that instance. A delegate is just an object that uh, implements a certain interface. And so uh, when we start uh, downloading or when we send an HTTP request, we just call the start method and it returns immediately. It is synchronous. But then later on, when uh, the execution returns to the uh, run loop, right, uh, the run loop will, uh, will be tracking the request, and when the data arrives, a callback on the delegate object will be called. But this is not a, a callback like, a, like in, in Node.js, for example. It is a predefined callback that is defined in the interface of the delegate. So this is a bit more structured approach to, to doing callbacks uh, when uh, compared to just <coughs> Uh, when compared to just calling methods and passing the callback in an undisciplined manner. Okay. So some of the drawbacks uh, of the run loops is that the, the most uh, the most inconvenient thing is that uh, it is difficult to do composition. So if you want to perform two tasks, two I/O tasks in a sequence, it is difficult to do because uh, we need to first wait for a callback to be called once the first task is finished, and only after that we can start uh, executing the second task. And this causes, uh, uh, well, due, due to this, the logic of our operation uh, tends to be spread across multiple method definitions, and this is not very pleasant. Right? And this, is, uh, also, this also applies to animations in a graphical user application, for example, because uh, Animations also work asynchronously, and if you want to chain multiple animations in a sequence, uh, well, it, uh, we don't have a very pleasant code that we are dealing with. Okay, so I think uh, async I/O with callbacks. I think we've all seen that. I don't really have much to say about it. It's not very good. So I think I/O with promises. This is uh, promises are like verified callbacks. So this is an example that doesn't use promises, it's just callbacks. We can see the typical nesting when we, we have finished one operation and in a callback we start another one. And in another callback we, we know that the both are finished. So promises uh, help us uh, removing the nesting, right? Uh, so to some, to some extent they alleviate the callback help. Uh, instead of nesting we get a sequence of functions, right? But there are still drawbacks because these functions, uh, they are separate. They don't share the lexical context. Uh, so if we, compared, if we would compare this to a simple 
a sequential code. In sequential code, we have local variables which can be reused until the end of the function. But uh, in this case, when using promises, we still get our logic spread across multiple functions or methods. All right, and so, yeah, we basically, unpleasant code is basically what uh, we should strive to avoid. And by unpleasant code, I mean the code that doesn't adhere to the three principles, working with values, uh, function composition, and uh, the code being declarative. Okay, so now we're getting a little bit closer to the pleasant side of things. So I think I go with the code rewriting. What I mean by that is that uh, we have a support in the, in the language itself of async operations that are then, so that compiler can help us in the organizing the code. Uh, so here's an example from a future version of JavaScript that uh, is still years from being adopted, right? But uh, we can see that this is the same code, well, the same logic that we saw previously here. So we have two operations that are performed one after another. But this version uses promises. This version uses the async additions that are coming to JS in some way, sometime in the future. And here we can see that this code looks a lot like sequential code. So we have uh, the function is marked as async, meaning that it will be executed asynchronously. And inside the function, we will call other async functions. But if we prepend, prepend the keyword await to the call, then effectively we, the logic of the code will, will block until the function returns, or until the asynchronous call finishes. And then the code resumes and continues uh, from, where it, uh, from where it left, we left off. Right, so this is a very, uh, well, this, uh, these tools like async and await help us uh, make our code more simple and closer to what we are used to, work, uh, to working with, which is a sequential code. So I think this has a great future. Now, a little bit, something a little bit more exotic, signals. So here, uh, I'm referring to Elm signals in particular. Elm, uh, if you haven't heard, is a pretty young language, which is uh, aimed to simplify client-side development uh, in, in the browsers. So it's like a replacement for JavaScript. But it's, the language itself is nothing like JavaScript. It's a functional language. Uh, and it bases uh, all interactions uh, with, the, with the outside world. Uh, it uses signals for that. So a signal can be described as a lazy sequence. So in your code, uh, for example, you want to process uh, events of mouse movement. So you get a signal that responds to the cursor position. And uh, you can map uh, on, the, on the signal like you would do on the sequence. Or you can fold it. And you can... Uh, write other logic around this uh, value that is extracted from the signal, right? And so when the mouse is actually moved, then the signal will generate new values. And then your code gets executed because a new value has been emitted. Your code is executed to do its thing, right? And your application gets a new state. So the code uh, evaluation depends on the external events coming in. If, if your code is not using any signals, then it doesn't even need to be evaluated because it is completely different. It doesn't have side effects, right? So this is an example from Elm. Uh, it looks a, bit, a little bit like Pascal, but it's, it's pretty different from Pascal. So I have uh, marked with uh, bold type the signals uh, that uh, we are using as simple values or as function calls uh, with zero error to, uh, whichever you prefer, right? And we can use functions uh, to map over signals so here, for example, we have an FPS, which is just a signal that, that will generate a, a value uh, periodically. And another signal is uh, it will generate a new value whenever the error keys are pressed. Right? And so this piece of code, together with the main function, which is the function uh, that is responsible for actually displaying something in the browser tab. So uh, they both get re-evaluated re whenever a new value comes on the signal. Right, so this is this looks a lot uh, like a functional approach because it has uh, I/O as value. It allows functional composition because we just treat uh, signals as uh, simple function calls, and uh, the code is completely declarative, unless we're using ports to communicate with JavaScript. 
uh, no side effects are present in it. Right. So this is this is quite nice, right? But the the, the drawback is that uh, a whole new language has uh, has been designed in order to provide this nicer way of uh, writing applications. And this language is still in development, right? So it's not a complete replacement to JavaScript. But we may try to emulate the concept of signals in other languages. It won't be as profound as it is in L, right? But uh, there is something that we can learn from it. And I don't know if I got the whatever. <laughs> okay, so now we come to the part uh, where we will be looking at an example uh, written in Elixir, and uh, this is just a problem. Mm, for which I will try multiple approaches, a problem that involves I.O. We will try multiple approaches and see how uh, each one looks and what's the best one. So this is our problem. Uh, we, will, well, we will imagine that we have a search service uh, for, in which we can search for a word and get back, uh, get back URLs uh, pointing to images. Then we can download those, those images, uh, do some processing on them, and then uh, we upload the resulting data as a single request to another hypothetical server. Okay, so these are the goals. Uh, we will start with the sequential version because it's like uh, the, simplest, uh, the simplest one to reason about. And uh, throughout our experimentation with different methods, we will try to keep uh, the code, uh, like keep it close to the original sequential version because that's the one that we would prefer to have uh, in our progress. It's more maintainable and easier to understand. Okay, so just a few words why I'm using it here. Well, simply because it's the language, the functional language I'm most comfortable with, and it is implemented on top of the Erlang OTP system. So it's basically Erlang uh, VM, Erlang libraries, and the OTP principle, principles minus the Erlang language, which is replaced by Elixir and its uh, core library. Right, and also Elixir supports uh, macros, uh, which allow us to transform syntax uh, of the language or define, uh, define, to some extent, new constructs in the language. And we will use that to, to come up with a nice notation for, for our I.O. code. Okay, so just some preliminaries. This is what we'll be working with. Pretty much we need the size uh, constant, which is just, we'll be using in the call to resizing images. And the URLs is a list of URLs that we assume we've already got. Okay, so the sequential version. Uh, I will explain a little bit the syntax. So we've got a call, enum, enum.map. Enum is a module, and uh, modules uh, are sets of functions. So enum is a module to work on, that works on collections. It provides functions like map, uh, filter, reduce, etc. And we're calling, uh, we're calling it uh, Python our URLs and then anonymous function. And inside that anonymous function, we define the, our algorithm. Right, so we're calling some functions, and uh, in the end, we return the pink data uh, for, for each image. And once we get all the images processed, we just upload them to a remote server. So this is the same code, uh, but written in a slightly less noisy style. Here we just uh, omit all local variables and using, uh, we are using the pipe uh, syntax. So the pipe operator takes uh, the expression on the left-hand side of it and uh, passes it as the first argument to the function call of, on the right. So in the first case, the fetch from URL will be called with the URL as argument, then uh, resize image will be called with the result of the previous step as the first argument and size as the second argument, and so on. And code to pink will be called with the result of the previous steps. So it's the same thing as before. We do, we're mapping over URLs and performing some actions. And this is an approximate visualization of what's going on. So we can see this is a simple loop. We're doing one thing at a time, and if one request takes a second, we'll spend 10 seconds simply fetching images and uh, finishing this whole thing. So there's, there's got to be a way to improve that. So this is a, a, 
a naive, naive approach to parallelizing this thing. So here, all we, we did, instead of map, we're using a pmap. And a pmap is just a, a way to call a function that performs, uh, the, it calls the anonymous function on each element of the list in parallel. So for this, we're, we're using uh, Erlang processors, which Elixir inherits. Uh, Erlang processors are, well, they are lightweight, they are like green threads, and we can have thousands of them. And therefore, uh, in this case, this solution could actually work, right? So, for example, if we, if we were using another language where we would need to use threads for each of the, para for each of the execution to be, to be able to achieve parallelism, right? Uh, this would not uh, scale as well as processes in uh, Elixir do, right? But this is a simple example, right? And uh, in, in the real world, uh, we usually have uh, a lot of concerns that are just not accounted for in uh, examples like this. For example, uh, when we have uh, image resizing and encoding to ping, we might want to do that on uh, using some kind of pool which would limit the concurrency. So we know that the resources of our systems are limited. And so we want to have a pool of workers uh, in order to limit the concurrency and to ensure that no more than a certain size uh, of computation or a certain amount of computation is performed uh, at any given time. Okay, so yeah, that's just a visualization of what we had. Like each, we can see that each URL is, uh, is uh, uh, processed independently of the other ones, but the concurrency is uncontrollable, right? If we add more URLs, we'll get more processes and this could lead uh, to overloading our system. So now this is where it becomes hairy. Uh, here we take an approach at uh, adding pools. And so there you can see here, we're still using PMAP to fetch all of the image data, right? But then uh, the PMAP using pool function, we're assuming that uh, it, will, it will take the incoming list that it gets, and it will execute it in parallel, but using only the predefined amount of workers, right? So if we have three workers, it will only have three parallel uh, threads of execution. And so uh, we do that for resizing images and we, we get our scaled images. Then after that, we start doing the uh, ping encoding and in the end we get uh, the same result that we uh, got before. Okay, so this is the same thing uh, just without the local variables using the familiar five syntax. And here, one thing that I should mention the ampersand that you see here, uh, that's just a shortcut notation for, for taking a value of a function. So in Elixir, in, in Erlang, functions have names and cavities. Two functions with the same name, uh, but different arrays are basically different functions. Right? So uh, in order to take a value of a function, we need to mention its cavity. And then we're just saying that we want to use the function fetch from URL that has one argument. And in the second case, uh, that resize image call, uh, it's just we basically perform carrying. We're passing one argument to it, and uh, another argument is marked with a placeholder. And so this becomes a function of one argument. When, when it will be passed an argument, it will be called with it. Okay, so this is what's going on in that code. Right, so we managed to parallelize, uh, to make each stage of the pipeline parallel, to run in parallel. But uh, between the stages, we have these synchronization points at which we are waiting for the data to arrive uh, from the previous step. And, but we don't need this, uh, right? This is not the most efficient way to do this because uh, once we get uh, image data from the remote server, we can already pass it to the resizing uh, pool. We don't need to wait for the other images to arrive, right? So this code, uh, that we have so far doesn't account for that. So we'll try to make it a little, bold, a little bit more smarter. Okay, so here again, uh, we have our algorithm below, below like, and this, uh, uh, this involves a little bit, a little bit more trickery uh, in Elixir. So uh, again, we see our enum module and we're calling the into function. Into is like a sync. It takes a collection, the collection on the, as the first argument, 
and it syncs it into the, like, the sync that is the second argument. So here we define our calls uh, as things, uh, as things, right? And uh, uh, we're <coughs> fetching, fetching the initial image data into a stream. So a stream in Elixir is a, a lazy sequence, so kind of similar to the signals uh, in L. And so what happens here is that we're, well, a lot of the details are hidden in the implementations of, of the pools that we're not showing here. But the idea is that we can fetch images uh, in parallel and we put the results in a stream, right? And that stream is uh, a lazy sequence. Only when we begin reading from it, we will be passing a value next uh, down the pipeline. So we get the stream from the, with the fetched images, which is just a promise that uh, the fashion will be executed at some point in the future. And we pass that into the resizing pool. So the resizing pool will be able to read from that and it returns another stream. Uh, and this new stream uh, is again a lazy sequence, but this time of the images that have been resized. And so we get the resized images, we pass them down the pipeline, and we get and then encoded, and so on. And in the end, uh, what we're doing, we're syncing our final stream into a list. And a list doesn't do any, any complex processing, it just realizes every element of the stream and puts it into a list. And so what we end up with is that once we execute the enum into the empty list, uh, we're like we're pulling the stream from the other end. And so this causes the, the images to be downloaded and the pools get their streams. They, they are able to perform the tasks in parallel, right? But uh, since we're using the stream to pull down the data, we will be getting each, uh, each processed result as soon as it, it is ready. Right? So the pool uh, can perform the performance job and continue working on the images that are still to be processed. But the images that have been processed, they can already be sent down the pipeline. And so, yeah, so uh, this example achieves like the the case that we are aiming for in terms of execution. It allows us to execute multiple operations in parallel and we are not waiting uh, idly for all of them, for, for example, for all images to be downloaded before uh, proceeding to the next step. But now, we, all that's left is pretty fine a little bit. And so here we're using a macro to let us write the same code in a nice survey. So pipeline here is a macro. And this macro, it's, uh, we're passing it the same uh, pipeline that we, that we saw in the first sequential version. So I have here the sequential version we've already seen. So here we just defined uh, the anonymous function that processed one URL. And then we use that function to map over all of the URLs. Here we're doing something similar. We define a single function that uh, processes one URL, right? But since it's a macro, we are able to look at the syntax tree and uh, see what's going on there. So there you, you can see calls to use pool. That's just a signal to that macro that uh, before the resize image, we want to use pool resizing pool. It means that the actual function call to resize image will be performed inside the resize pool. So we'll just we'll convert this code into the one we saw before, like this scary, a little bit scary code, right? But uh, the, more, the important difference is that here we used, uh, we operated on a sequence, uh, a sequence of uh, image data, then on a sequence of scaled images, then on a sequence of pink data. Right, we implemented on uh, complete sequences. But in this code, we are back to operating on a single URL. Right, and we let the macro, which we need to implement ourselves, of course, yeah, but uh, what we get from it is that we, we describe our algorithm in terms of one URL and we let the macro to convert the codes to the form that is uh, most efficient. Okay. Okay, so some conclusions. What have we learned? Well, we've learned, uh, we look at the different approaches uh, and uh, the things that uh, we can take from this is that People have been trying to do different things to, to think how it's, how, which way is better to handle I.O., right? 
and uh, different languages have different characteristics that allow for, for different kinds of uh, approaches to be used. For example, approach, an approach used by Elm is really difficult to emulate in languages that are eager and are not lazy. All right. Okay, so... Um, and uh, Elixir in this case, uh, well, I haven't shown a lot of the details you know, that are underpinning uh, the, the algorithm that we are able to write in the code at the high level. Right? But uh, what's going on under the hood is we are using uh, processes to implement parallelism. parallelism. And uh, an interesting thing, I think, in our example with Elixir, let me go back. Right, so, for example, we have this call to fetch from URL. This is the same call as where we used in this sequential version. It is a blocking call, so uh, we are blocking the current spread of execution until we get back the image data. Then this is not an async call. And we are able to reuse it in this uh, uh, concurrent version because uh, in Erlang we can, uh, within a single process, we can issue blocking calls to I.O. or to do computation and this won't affect other processes because all processes run concurrently and they are isolated, right? And thanks to that, uh, we are able to get from a sequential version to one that is more scalable uh, without rewriting uh, the, all of the code. In a language that, uh, that doesn't support that, that requires uh, one to use asynchronous functions to achieve parallelism, Yep. So in, in that language, we would be we would uh, need to go from a blocking calls to asynchronous calls, and so the transitions would, the transition would be a little bit more involved. But uh, the nice thing about Elixir is that it builds on top of Erlang, and we are able to cheat a little bit here. And uh, additionally, macros helped us simplify the code, and this is pretty much. Uh, this is pretty much what, we're, what we were starting to achieve, right? Okay, so what can other languages do? Well, uh, if you look, for example, at uh, F-sharp and its asynchronous workflows, it uh, does allow us to achieve a similar, uh, a similar goal, right? So we can run a code that uh, pretty much sequential, is pretty much sequential looking, but that performs concurrently and uh, is able to handle multiple tasks at the same time. But again, the caveat here is that uh, in, the, in, the, in a language like f -sharp, we need to use the asynchronous framework and we need to use the calls that are asynchronous uh, to perform uh, I.O. operations. Whereas in our Elixir case, we could uh, use the same uh, blocking calls that we've been using before. Okay, so that's all I have, thanks. Do you have any questions for the speakers? Please. Um, it will be interesting to see the pipeline macro. Or is that too scary to show? Oh. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I will be able to publish the code a little bit later. Okay. And so the other thing is, uh, since you're using Erlang processes and to do the asynchronous, so do you... Uh, so is it a bit obfuscated where things are running? Can it even run on a different uh, machine or something? I don't know much about that, like, but... Well, yeah, in, in theory you could run uh, a certain processes on a different machine, right? But uh, the, the important thing here is that one, one single task, like fashion an image, it doesn't uh, involve any concurrency per se, right? This is a task that does, does all the job in one process. And so we keep these tasks, these different functions down. They don't know about different processes. They just perform sequential code. And so uh, thanks to that, we can externally schedule all these functions to run in different processes. And by running different processes, we can achieve concurrency or we can run them sequentially, whichever we want. Can we have another question? I know it's a big thing, but uh, just, uh, except for using the Erlang style processes, which is a big help here, of course, uh, it seems that everything hinges on the macro that actually wraps around the code that can stay down, so to speak, 
and perform everything in parallel because you wrap it up in a macro. Would such this kind of a macro be also possible in Scala or any other languages for that matter? Well, it very well may be. So I'm not familiar with, with Scala to, to give you an exact answer, but yeah, the idea is that uh, the macro in this case it just uh, lets us get the code that already does the job and make it nicer. So another language with a macro uh, with a macro system could also do that. Scala, uh, Scala also has a to wait and it's implemented by Scala macro. Okay. Okay. Do we have any more questions? No. Okay. Please. Uh, <coughs> all right. One final. Not found. Yeah, so in the Elixir case, we're handling errors using the supervisors, the uh, common approach uh, in any language that builds on the Erlang VM. Right, so uh, I have uh, omitted the issue of error handling because it is a rather specific to languages. So in a language with async function calls, we would have a, a little bit different handling uh, than here. So in, in Elixir, we would just set up the supervisor tree. So each process uh, is linked to a supervisor, and if there is uh, some error, the process dies, and we're able to catch that uh, up the tree and do add some processing to that error. There was another question here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, one question about uh, macros, Elixir. Uh, would it be possible uh, to implement some kind of monolith style in Elixir with macros if one wanted to do that? Well, uh, there is uh, an approximation of a monolith style. So the, the thing is that uh, in Elixir there are no types. So we cannot use the type system to, to decide which uh, monolith to use in a particular case. Right? So, but there is... Uh, there is a project, it is called, uh, I think it's called Monadic, actually. I, I can give you the link later. So it actually implements, with, with the help of macros, different uh, patterns uh, that involve uh, like the code that usually nests. With the help of the, this project, uh, these macros, you can unnest the code and perform steps in a sequential way. All right, thank you very much.